knows the Pentagon. Over the years, it's become an international symbol and an American icon. But that's almost an accident. It was built in a rush to meet a looming crisis. Its shape was determined by circumstance. It was supposed to be a temporary headquarters for the Army. Early 1941, Hitler's stormtroopers had already overrun Eastern Europe and invaded Russia. Japan's armies were pushing even further into the Asian mainland. Despite strong domestic opposition, U.S. military leaders were already gearing up for America's anticipated entry into the war. Army offices were scattered through 17 buildings in Washington, D.C. To disguise the increasing military presence, officers and NCOs reported to work in civilian clothes. That included General Brehan Burke Somerville, head of Army Construction. His solution to the Army's space problem built the biggest office building in the world across the Potomac River in Virginia. He brought his staff together on uh, this Thursday night in July 1941 and uh, just gave him these instructions. I want a building big enough to house 40,000 people with parking for 10,000 cars, uh, 4 million square feet, and I want the plans on my desk Monday morning. The original plan for the Pentagon was drawn up over a long weekend. The original site was bounded by roads that required that the building if to be within those roads would be a Pentagon, but a rather irregular one. That original site was on farmland along Memorial Drive, the road that still leads into Arlington National Cemetery. But there was controversy. Critics loudly complained the huge new building would mar the view from the tomb of Pierre L'Enfant, designer of the layout of Washington. President Roosevelt picked a new site in a marshy area about a half mile downriver. Former Second Lieutenant Bob Furman saw the area before a shovel of earth was turned. Back of where I'm standing was a, was a development of homes. In back of the Pentagon on the south side was a big brickyard, many, many acres in here of experimental agricultural work, and a railroad ran right through the middle of it. The location may have changed, but the design concept didn't. They were moving so quickly with the project that the architects just decided to keep that five-sided shape. The new site down here wasn't five-sided, but uh, there really wasn't time to change it. General Somerville, nicknamed Dynamite in a Tiffany Box, helped push quick congressional approval of the new War Department building, as it was first called. He didn't tolerate any, any, anything which didn't get the job done immediately. Ground was broken on September 11, 1941, just seven weeks since the idea of the building was first proposed. That night, President Roosevelt went on the radio to warn of the threat from Germany. When you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he is struck before you crush him. The goal was to begin moving people into the building within six months. Less than three months after groundbreaking, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on a Sunday morning. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We knew that the world had changed. Helen McShane Bailey, she was Helen McShane then, was one of thousands of young women moving to Washington to take federal jobs. She still recalls the drastic change she saw at her office in the War Department when she went to work the day after the attack. And I walked up to my office, and as I'm coming in, I'm seeing all these men who used to wear civilian clothes are now in Army uniforms with their ranking signia on their shoulders, and I was in shock. And they were in shock. Pearl Harbor changed everything. All restrictions were off money roll and construction efforts speeded up tremendously. At the peak, there were about 15,000 people working on the building around the clock. Construction workers flocked to Washington from across the country. 
The building was to be four floors and made of reinforced concrete with no steel beams. More than 41,090-foot pilings were driven into the ground to support the structure. Five and a half million cubic yards of sand and dirt were pumped from the river to raise the building level above the floodplain. The Pentagon went up in sections, later called wedges. As one wedge was nearing completion, another was started. Hundreds of draftsmen were working all hours in an old airplane hangar, cranking out design plans for the building as it was being built. They were working so fast they were getting ahead of the plans. The plans sometimes were delivered after they'd already done some of the work on them. The result is you do have some irregularities inside. Years later, it was discovered that there were some pockets in the building that were completely sealed off and nobody knew about. They were there. By May 1st of 1942, six months into construction, the first wedge was largely finished. Army personnel began moving in. There were stories about cement cave-ins in offices where people had to jump to get out of the way of, of cement coming down on them. And of course, it was muddy all around. They walked on planks. But the building was open and functioning. Huge office bays with up to 400 desks were the norm. Early in the move-in period, it was officially renamed the Pentagon Building, and a decision was made to add a fifth floor. The papers that Somerville uh, submitted to Congress described the fifth floor as the fourth floor intermediate. And it, it really wasn't until um, about four or five months after they were um, constructing the fifth floor that people in Congress figured out what was going on. The construction caused chaos had calmed by the time Army Chief of Staff General George Marshall moved his office and staff to the building in November. Helen McShane was on that staff. Got to be total routine, get on the bus, get off the bus, get on the escalator, get up the ramp, get into your office, open up the files, <laughs> filing cabinets, <laughs> get everybody organized, and the phone will start ringing. The plain, bland, functional building turned out to have a distinctive character. The entrances have simple architectural detail fronted by unadorned neoclassical columns. The facing of the building is Indiana limestone, and the Pentagon shape turned out to be hugely efficient. The final design is five concentric buildings called rings with light wells in between. Corridors on the corners allowed for diagonal routes from one part of the building to another. In theory, it should take only seven minutes to get from one point to any other. A large network of roadways and overpasses had to be built to provide access to what was then an isolated location. It really was a small city. And there had to be services, post office, banks, shops, cafeterias, services which can still be found in the building. You absolutely had to have them because there was no way you could have that many people get in their cars and drive anywhere and it would take them uh, longer than any lunch hour. At its World War II peak, well over 30,000 people worked in the building. Construction was declared completed on January 15, 1943. Total cost, including building, roadways and landscaping, $85 million. From the beginning, the Pentagon has generated stories. A few are fact, more are fiction. The one of the favorites, the Western Union telegraph boy who entered the building on a Friday and emerged on a Monday as a lieutenant colonel. FDR had plans to convert the Pentagon into an archive after the post-war demobilization. There was also talk of turning it into a hospital.